you get there any way you can. I welcome once again to our annual Academy Awards special, an hour-long and highly personal and opinionated program on which we do not predict who will win this year's Academy Awards. I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. We immodestly call our special if we pick the Oscars because we're going to give you our preferences, not our predictions, our preferences as critics as to who we'd vote for if we had a ballot. And unfortunately, no critic has one. And unlike the Oscar cast itself, we don't make you wait three hours before we get to the big categories you really care about. <laughs> Roger? That's right. We're going to start right out with the Best Actress category, which has one new face this year and four very familiar faces. The first nominee, Anne Bancroft, played the very bright and determined Mother Superior in Agnes of God. She was paired with Jane Fonda as a psychiatrist investigating the murder at a convent. Exactly. I want you to deal with Agnes as speedily and as easily as possible. She won't hold up under any sort of cross-examination. I am not with the Inquisition. And I'm not from the Middle Ages. I know what you are. I don't want that mind cut open. First-time nominee Whoopi Goldberg starred in Steven Spielberg's The Color Purple as a turn-of-the-century southern black woman who survived great suffering and finally found happiness. Jessica Lange was nominated for Sweet Dreams, where she played country singer Patsy Cline, a small-town girl who thought she could sing and who went all the way to the top before her tragic death. Geraldine Page got her eighth Oscar nomination for The Trip to Bountiful, playing an old lady who was bound and determined to see her childhood home one more time before she died. You know, it's funny, but ever since we got here, I just, I had half a feeling that my father and my mother would come out of this house, greet me, and welcome me home. And Meryl Streep was nominated for Out of Africa, where she plays Danish writer Isaac Dennison in a love story about a woman making a life for herself on a coffee plantation in East Africa. You would come and go from my house. If that's all right. When the gods want to punish you, they answer your prayers. And those are the nominees, and now I've got Gene's vote here, and I'm going to see who you would select in this category. Right. And your choice would be Whoopi Goldberg for Best Actress mm -hmm. from the Color Purple. Why don't you look at my ballot there? Okay, let's see if I can find it. Here it is. Oh, Roger, you're getting smarter and smarter on the show. Right. You pick Whoopi Goldberg, too. That's right. I pick Whoopi Goldberg, and my second choice, it's a close call, but my second choice would be Geraldine Page, who I think gives a very full performance in most every scene. But Whoopi Goldberg touched me more deeply with short, perfect bites of emotion and expression. She made the much-abused Seeley come alive with all of her vulnerability. Now I'm going to tell you in narration exactly why I think this performance is so good. Here's the scene where she is about to meet the woman that her husband really loves. And she has mixed emotions here. She feels she's been told that she's so ugly so long, and we can see the pain, and yet at the same time, she's got this competing emotion, which she's trying, like any other human being, to make a good impression. There are two emotions in her at this moment, one of anger and one of attempted pride, and Whoopi Goldberg is presenting both of those emotions in this scene beautifully. This is a very fine, modulated performance. Well. I can't say anything more than that. This is a first-time performance, as Roger mentioned. There's not a mistake made in it. We care deeply about Seeley. Have to give credit to the director who directed her, Steven Spielberg. But boy, she sure came prepared to work on this film. Rod, what do you for? I agree with you, Gene. I think it was a great performance. And what's interesting to me is that Whoopi Goldberg only had a background on stage, doing her one-man shows. And before that, she was doing stand-up comedy. Frequently, people with that kind of a background go over the top in That's film. That's correct. Too hard. That's Here, right. What's important, because she is for so much of her life, the victim, the person who was told how to behave and what to say and where to sit and what to do, she plays down, and yet at the same time we get this enormous feeling of strength inside her, this personality that at the end is triumphant. And to modulate that, you use the word, to modulate that so that at the end it's all there is a great achievement and it's a great performance. It would be my selection if I, if I had a ballot tomorrow. Okay, coming up next, our selections for the best song.
Before we get to best song, first the nominees for the very important category, original screenplay. These are the unsung heroes of Hollywood, the people who come up with the original ideas, the original scripts for movies. Bless them, one and all. The nominees are Back to the Future, that wonderful, funny time travel comedy written by Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale. Doc, I'm from the future. I came here in a time machine that you invented. Now I need your help to get back to the year 1985. Also nominated, Terry Gilliam, Tom Stoppard, and Charles McKeon for their ghastly view of a bureaucratic future in the dark comedy, Brazil. Welcome to the team. Yes, sir. Cancel that. Send two copies to Mike. Also nominated from Argentina, the heartbreaking political drama, The Official Story, written by Luis Puenzo and Aida Bortnik, the story of a woman who adopted a baby illegally. Heifel se llamaba el médico, Heifel. No me acuerdo, Alicia, ¿cómo cree que me acuerde? ¿Cómo no te vas a acordar del médico que te dio a Gaby? Dijimos que nunca íbamos a hablar de eso, also nominated, Woody Allen's wonderful tribute to the movies and to the I'm people who go to them I'm and worship them. The Purple Tom. Rose of Cairo. How do you know Tom? You get, you, oh my God, I don't believe it. You get, I've seen you in lots of movies. Where's Tom? Oh, Broadway Bachelors, right? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, you know. Honeymoon in Haiti? Done about in six. You were scream. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's <laughs> try to do one a year, you know, just to keep... You, uh, where, where, where's Tom? And finally, the police thriller Witness, written by Earl N. Wallace Lieutenant and William Scott. Kelly, showing us two worlds, right. urban Philadelphia and the Amish community yeah, in Pennsylvania. It all fits, Paul. Four years ago, Narcotics runs a raid in which, amongst other things, 550 gallons of this P2P stuff is confiscated. They put it in police storage. Philadelphia supplies all the major cities in the country with speed. They need this P2P stuff to make the speed. Five very good scripts. Now let's take a look who Roger voted for. Best original screenplay from Argentina, the official story. That's right, Gene. I thought it was a really, it was original in the best sense of the word original, and then it came up with a story that wasn't recycled well, out of lots out. of other movies. And your vote for the best original screenplay is also the official story. So it shows you have very good taste. Thank you. The official story was a movie that told a story that was kept a very dark secret in Argentina for many years. The story of what happened to thousands of political prisoners who disappeared from their everyday lives, many of them never to be seen again. The movie tells the story from the point of view of the rich wife of a high-ranking executive, a woman who deeply loves the baby daughter she adopted five years ago, but now she's visited by an old friend in this scene, a friend who was a prisoner, and she learns that her baby may have been stolen from its real mother. <laughs> That is a very wonderful Argentine actress named Norma Aleandro there playing that mother and have we picked the Oscar nominees, as mm -hmm. well as the Oscars, I, I think that is one of my selections for oh, Best absolutely. Actress this year. Now let's look at this script, because some people might say, oh, you guys just love this script because it's heartbreaking. And mm -hmm. I want to say, that's part of it, but I like the construction of this script. I'm really talking about this script because this script fooled me. I did not know which way she was going to go because you know what? Her character didn't know which way she was going to go. There was a lot of pressure there, competing pressure, and the script compacted it. I want this baby, it's mine, but I got it under the wrong circumstances. Would I keep a secret? That's exciting, mm -hmm. dramatic writing. And you know, in terms of a screenplay, so many screenplay writers seem to have learned how to write screenplays by looking at millions of other movies, mm -hmm. so they know the structure so well that we know the structure too. <laughs> funny. So we can say, okay, here's where we are. We can walk out, walk in the middle of a movie and almost know what's going to be next in a lot of routine movies. This one had the spontaneity of life itself, and that was what was terrific about it. 
Our next category is for the best original song. And it wasn't too many years ago that Gene and I were singling out this category <laughs> for some of our selections for the worst nominations of the year because the songwriters branch of the Academy was operating like a private club nominating its own insiders. Well, I think you're about 60% right because there were three of the five songs that I actually had heard of but when the nominations list came out. That's usually about three more, as you said. And your pick for best song, Say You, Say Me, Lionel Richie from White Knights. That's right. And you would vote for... Not would, will want to have voted for <laughs> surprise surprise from a chorus line yeah uh, i always pick a song in this category that i think is really in the movie and not just stuck onto the end credits like a lot of songs are and although i like the power of love from uh, back of the future is the best song i think it's a wonderful song whenever i hear it in the radio i turn it up i still think that within the movie surprise surprise from a chorus line written by Marvin Hamlish and Ed Kleban, which is written new for this film, is really in the spirit of the show, in the spirit of the movie, and that's why I'm voting for it. We get the sense of surprise that these faceless kids in the chorus can really perform. Greg Burge is the dancer in this scene. First time we made love, it was a great fear. I was too scared to be from trying. My selection this year is really just a matter of my favorite song among the nominees, which I suspect actually is the same criteria used by most of the voters. They are not going in there with the Siskel test. Does this movie I know uh, benefit from this song? Is it organically I part of it? They're saying, which one have I heard on the radio the most? I know, and they're wrong. Well, they're wrong. And so are you. you. But in any event, Say You, Say Me <laughs> by Lionel Richie, written and performed by him in White Nights, is my selection. If you stop to think about it, this song didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Why would Lionel Richie suddenly start singing in the middle of Russia in a movie about spies, politics, and ballet dancers? But I liked it anyway. Say you, say me. Now you might have noticed one item of interest in both of the song excerpts that we just showed you. What we saw there were not actual clips from the two movies but clips from the music videos inspired by those movies and by the songs that were in them. And that's a sign of the times as movies and music and videos all get mixed up together into one big profitable promotion. This is the ultimate extension of what I used to call the semi-obligatory lyrical interlude, the moment in a movie when everything stops so they can put in the hit song, which they hope will spin off lots of profits. Yeah, well, I still don't think you should vote for it when they stick in the hit song while the end credits are rolling. It's got to be integral to the movie. The Siskel test should be the test for all the voters. Coming up next, our choices for Best Supporting Actor. special edition of At The Movies, we're making our personal Oscar selections of who we'd choose if we were voting for the Academy Awards. And I, they won't I kind let of us. wish that I had a ballot. Wouldn't mm -hmm. that be fun? Yeah. I could get them all right. Our next, of course, we have a show like this. Our next category <laughs> is for Best Supporting Actor. And let's take a look at the nominees. The first nominee is one of the real veterans in this year's field, Don Amici, chosen for his work as an old man who gets a new lease on life in Cocoon. I'm very happy, Miss. Everything's happening so fast. Are you talking about last night? No, no, last night was fine. Fine? More than fine. Terrific. I was talking in general. Well, in general, I think we're having a great time. Klaus Maria Brandauer, that excellent Austrian actor, was nominated for Out of Africa, where he played Meryl Streep's cheating but charming husband. I've got this terrible urge to kiss you. You're smarter than I am, Meg Over. Good luck, Tony. William Hickey was nominated for Pritzi's Honor for his unforgettable performance as an ancient mafia don who tries to keep peace in a family of professional killers. Yes, Johnny. He's like my son. 
I pledged to be his second father on the day that he was born. But grandfather... Shut up. Have another cookie, my dear. Robert Loggia was nominated for Jagged Edge for his performance as a stubborn yeah, private investigator who helps night. Glenn Close sort out a list of murder suspects. What about former club members? People who quit after January of last year. Come on, Teddy, that's a wild goose chase. Sam, he didn't do it. Yeah? Is that your head talking or another part of your anatomy? And Eric Roberts was nominated for Runaway Train as a convict who joins the desperate John Voight in an escape attempt. No, I'm not going to give you no reason to kill me, Manny. Please don't. Okay. I need some shoes, Manny. Those are the nominees, and now I'm going to check out Gene's ballot and see who he would vote for in this category. And you would vote for Klaus Maria Brandauer for Out of Africa. I came close to picking William Hickey. He was good in that film. Puts his honor. And you vote for... Klaus Maria Brandauer, Out of Africa, great minds run in the same circle. I even thought that Out of Africa would have been interesting if Klaus Maria Brandauer had been given the lead over Robert Redford. I think Brandauer makes this often dull movie for me come alive every time he's on the screen. The reason? The unpredictability of his moves, his mood, his temperament, his speech pattern. He's always fascinating, always threatening. I thought you might be wanting a divorce. Has she got money? Of course she's got money. Is this important, bro? I suppose. Well, I'll have to accuse you of something. Or did you think you would have it the other way around? Mr. John Sutton, seven... Four. Fire away, whatever. I have surely done it. <laughs> Thank you. Do you manage it? Keep us friends. We start it that way. Brandauer is one of the great actors of our time. He was great in Mephisto. He was great in the James Bond film with Sean Connery, Never Say Never Again. This guy always clicks. And he's even in another movie that a lot of the voters will see this year, Colonel Reddle, which is one of the foreign film nominees. Klaus Maria Brandauer, one of the great European actors of the 80s. We're going to see him a lot. Coming up next, if we pick the Oscars, our choices for the best picture of the year. For this one on our show either, and you'll notice we had no dumb production numbers at the top of the show. Roger didn't do any dancing and neither did I. What makes you think those would have been dumb? Uh, I think they would have been dumb <laughs> and I think they would have been awkward. The nominees for best picture are the color purple, along with Out of Africa, it received 11 nominations the most this year. It's a miracle, isn't it? And no doubt impossible for you to believe. Olivia and Adam are with me. All growing up together. A family. Also nominated, the sexual political drama set in prison, Kiss of the Spider Woman. Resto, in a few minutes you'll be licking your fingers. I expect you to eat all of these chickens, both of them. Well, what about you? I'm not gonna just let you sit around and drool. No, I have to keep an eye on my girlish figure, at least what's left of it. Not yet, that's for dessert. And the story of a troubled love out of Africa, starring Meryl Streep and Robert Redford. Do you uh, have a gun? She won't like the smell of you. Shoot, shoot it. She's had breakfast. Don't. Sir. Please shoot her. Everybody's always falling. Also nominated, the mobster and domestic black comedy, Pritzy's Honor, for a wonderful film starring Kathleen Turner and Jack Nicholson. When you're just in love, it's just... Wait a minute. A hormonal secretion which changes the sense of smell so as to affect somebody in a certain way. That's what in love is. Who needs it? And finally, the police thriller that moves from Philadelphia to Amish country, 
witness. Could be with you. What a wonderful world this is. <laughs> 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 Now let's see who Roger picked for the biggie, best picture, and it is the color purple. That was my selection for the best picture of 1985, so it's certainly my selection <laughs> for the best Oscar You're nominee. consistent. And your ballot is marked for the color purple also for yeah. best picture. Yeah, but I liked other pictures that weren't nominated more, but of the ones that were nominated, this is my favorite. Okay, I would pick the color purple for a very personal and visceral reason, which is that it had the greatest emotional impact on me of any of the nominees, in fact, of any movie in a long time. This movie touched my heart very deeply with its story of a woman who suffers, who endures, and who finally prevails. In this scene, the woman, played by Whoopi Goldberg, waits as she does every day for a letter from the sister who has been taken away from her, a letter that never seems to come. And on the day when that letter finally does come, it's one of the most emotional moments in any movie. That moment and, of course, the moment of reunion at the end of that film, that really got to me. Our next category is Best Director, and usually the same five men who direct the five nominated pictures are nominated by the 230 members of the director's branch of the Academy. But not this time, as everyone knows, because instead of Steven Spielberg being nominated for The Color Purple, the Japanese master Akira Kurosawa was nominated for Ran, his magnificent adaptation of the King Lear drama. And that snub for uh, Spielberg was kind of balanced out by the fact that people were happy to see Kurosawa nominated. Yeah, so. that's true. Look at it that way. Your vote in this category for Best Director is Akira Kurosawa for Ran. That's because Ran was one of the pictures that I liked more than The Color Purple. And your vote for, and I think I know who you picked, you'd have to be, oh, this is a surprise, John Huston for Pritzi's Honor. I didn't think it was that big of a surprise, but my choice is John Huston, and I guess for me and maybe for the Academy, too. This is going to be a two-way award, an honor for Pritzi's Honor, which is a very good movie, and also an honor for John Huston's whole lifetime of achievement, which includes such wonderful movies as The Maltese Falcon, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, The African Queen, and The Man Who Would Be King. Pritzi's Honor tells the story of a man and woman who fall in love with each other and who are both mafia hitmen. And here's the scene at a dance where they meet for the first time. Some spread, huh? Haven't I seen you before? Sure, I'd remember. I mean, maybe you went to Marymount with the bride or something. <laughs> Could never miss you. And you are? Charlie Partan, pleased to meet you. Scott, let me look at you. Well, Amaya, what do you think? Such a one you are. Always making the show of yourself. Come on, Anna Maya. I got a reputation to live up to. I'm the family scandal. What's interesting there and all through the movie is the way John Huston builds his comedy on a sound, dramatic base. Mm -hmm. First, he starts with a good story and interesting characters, and then he adds the elements of humor and satire. There is a professional discipline there that makes the story better and the comedy more human. The same discipline you could see in The African Queen or The Man Who Would Be King, where it's a story and it's a comedy. He's one of the great ones, 79 years old, and my choice, he's a young guy, 75 years old, Kurosawa for directing Ran. I'll tell you, it was my favorite film of the year. I would have voted for it, as I mentioned, over The Color Purple if it had been nominated. And no one, no one in the world, and I think you will agree with this, no one in the world can direct an action scene with the quiet, mesmerizing energy of Akira Kurosawa. Look at this beautiful scene. The amazing thing is this man knows the power of quiet. The quiet of a battle scene can be more deafening mm -hmm. than all the noise. And also, one thing you can say about both Houston and Kurosawa, they've directed so long, they've lost patience with redundancy. They know what to leave out. There's not a wasted shot in most of their films. Next on this special program, who we'd pick if we could pick the best supporting actress.
Best Supporting Actress, and here is a category like Best Supporting Actor where all of the faces are new. None of these performers, these 10 actors and actresses, has ever been nominated before. And for one of them, Oprah Winfrey, the nomination came for her very first movie performance. Let's look at the nominees. In the color purple, Margaret Avery played Suge Avery, the juke joint singer who first laughs at Whoopi Goldberg and then teaches her about love. Angelica Houston was nominated for Pritzi's Honor as the mafia princess who was jilted by Jack Nicholson, but who bides her time and waits for revenge. You want to do it, Charlie? Is that what you want? Whoa. <laughs> Take it easy. What the hell, May? <laughs> Nobody took it slower than me, Charlie. Four years. Answer the question. You want to do it? Amy Madigan has a key role in Twice in a Lifetime as Gene Hackman's daughter, who bitterly resents her father's decision to leave her mother for another woman. I'll say it for her. Keep your hands off of my father and out of my family. Do you hear me? Get angry. Meg Tilly was nominated for Agnes of God as an innocent young nun who becomes the center of a mystery after she bears a child and then kills it. I could never be a mother. Why not? Well, I don't think I'm old enough. Besides, I don't want to have a baby. Why not? Because I don't want one. And Oprah Winfrey, in her first movie role, played Sophia, the woman who wants to marry the son of a man who obviously doesn't have one shred of respect for her. Who the daddy? Papa. How he know that? He know because he's the only one. Those are the nominees, and I'm going to look at Jean's ballot here in this category, Best Supporting Actress, Angelica Houston for Pritzi's Honor. Oh, yeah. I thought she was great. And your vote is for, uh, we have a difference here, Amy Madigan, Twice in a Lifetime. Mm -hmm. I pick Angelica Houston because I think it's the performance in this group with the most subtle and intriguing dramatic arch. Very tough to achieve, especially in what essentially is a comedy. You can do it in a drama, but to do it in a comedy, that's really something. Angelica Houston's character is the spurned former lover of mobster Jack Nicholson, and she is secretly a seething woman, and we don't know that right away. She is always plotting her revenge every step of the way. She hides that from us for a while. I love that about her performance. So, uh, how's the decorating business? Oh, it's just great, Charlie. We're always busy. Everything is Art Deco now. Art who? Charlie, our deco, you know, after our nouveau, is a stylist, not a person. You know, it's like all that air taste stuff. Damn. me. I should have known to stay away. What well, happened? to my father he called me a whore we talked about the final scene in the color purple the final scene in Pritzi's honor that's played by angelica houston is one of the great movie scenes of all time and of course uh, for the academy awards it gives you a great bit of uh academy symbolism because 39 years ago john houston directed his father mm -hmm. in treasure of the sarah madre who won an academy award now here he's directing his daughter almost four i hope you i hope she wins well my choice though would be amy madigan gene and this was a difficult choice in this very talented field, but I would vote for Amy Madigan because her performance was not only brilliant, but was central to the movie. She was the character who held together the two sides of the story in Twice of a Lifetime, who stood up to her father after he decided to leave her mother for the woman that he had met down at the corner bar. Here Amy is in a key scene with Gene Hackman and the other woman, Anne Margaret. In case you forgot, this is my mother. What do you mean by that? Your wife. That's what I mean by that. Well, I sure as hell know who my wife is, yes. I'd sure in hell like to know who this is. Well, that's Miss Manelli, in case you're interested and it's any of your business, which of course it is not. Which I'm here to tell you it is. The anger that comes out of her character there is interesting because it's anger directed both at her, at her father and also at herself because she realizes that in her life, 
some of the same themes are likely to I think to she did place. a very good job, Roger, but I'm going to disagree with you. We often disagree mm -hmm. on this show. I think that Houston's performance is better because I think there are more shadings to it. Uh, Madigan is one note anger done beautifully, but Houston, she's all I, over the emotional map. I d totally disagree with you. You've forgotten, for example, about the quiet scene she has with uh, her sister Ali Sheedy in the movie, or the confrontations with her with her husband, the young man who is kind of following after her father. I think Madigan has just as many emotional shadings as Angelica Houston. Well, coming up next, another important category: best actor. <laughs> The Oscars continues now with the nominees for Best Actor, and they include Harrison Ford, the cop on the trail of a murder in Witness. Come here, Samuel. Sit down. This is a loaded gun. This is very, very dangerous. Never, ever touch a loaded gun. No, I'll... James Garner, the most eligible bachelor in town, in Murphy's Romance. Well, I've known some of you since I was a boy in this town. I, uh, I kissed Margaret there out behind the barn when I was eight years old and learned some of the possibilities of life. <laughs> <laughs> I got some of Freeman's blood in me and came up with a pint or two when I needed it. My friends have overlooked my shortcomings and seen me through some dark days. Wait. William Hurt as the homosexual the imprisoned or? in Kiss of the Spider Woman. Ago. Look, I don't explain my movies. It just ruins the emotion. This must have been a Nazi propaganda film done during the war. I don't know. That's just the background. This is where the important part begins, the part about the lovers. <laughs> Jack Nicholson, the thick-headed but romantic mafia hitman in Pritzi's honor. How can I live with this? I gotta do something about it. I gotta straighten it out. Then do. Do what? Do I ice her? Do I marry her? Which one of these? I'm gone. Finally, John Voight, a hardened convict on the run again in Runaway Train. The real gun! Well, got that brain. What did you say? No brains, no brains. That's mean. That's truth. And now, Raj, your vote for best actor. John Voight, Runaway Train. Kind of a surprise, I suppose. Yeah, but to me. That was my final decision. And you select Jack Nicholson in Fritzy's Honor, which is not a surprise. I pick him every year. <laughs> okay. My first inclination in this category, you picked Jack Nicholson in years when he wasn't nominated. You better believe it. My first inclination, I have to admit, was to go with either William Hurt or Jack Nicholson. But then the more I thought about John Voight's performance, the stronger it began to seem to me. Here was an actor playing completely against type, playing a kind of role he had never played before, a savage, angry, escaped convict whose protest is not only against the society that locked him up, but also against the very rules that govern that society and indeed the entire universe. Here is Voight on board a runaway train that is hurtling across Alaska, giving an impassioned defense of what he believes in. You listen to me! And when a man walks in at the end of the day... Now, they're hurtling in a train that's going 70 miles an hour across the frozen Alaskan tundra, and he's not even looking outside. He's not even aware of what's happening outside of that train because, in a way, his whole life has been like this. Closed up in a little prison. Now it's a railroad cab. Before that, it was a prison cell. Hurtling out of control into a destination that he doesn't know. And look at those eyes. Look at that finger pointing. Look at the energy and the anger and the savage, almost vicious energy that he's bringing to this speech. This is a John Voight we've never seen before. This is not the gentle, laid back, philosophical John Voight that we've seen in movies like Conrad. This is a Voight who is filled with anger and with a very fundamental rage against the universe, and it's one of his greatest performances. Until you get that shiny clean. And on Friday, you pick up your paycheck. And if you could do that, if you could do that, you could be president of Chase Manhattan. Corporations. If you could do that. No question, that is the best scene in that movie. Now, my choice is Jack Nicholson. I don't know another actor who could make this material so watchable with his charm, his joy, his mischievousness. It infects the entire movie. I feel like I'm drowning or something. I mean, 
covered up the Vegas scam to protect her. That's what I thought we did for our women. How can that be a sin against honor? Huh? She is a hitter and a thief. You must give her to us. What is now your here answer? is an amazing decision he has to make. He's been told that these mobsters want his permission to kill his wife. He is not too smart a guy, and you can see that's a very dumb and funny look that Nicholson is doing in a very serious matter. He wants to play by the mob rules. That's all he knows, but he's totally confused. And here's an actor with the confidence to act with his back toward us, because we know the confusion that is on his face, and we don't really have to see his face. Nicholson, an actor who's so good he can act with his back. Family is the only place I can be. I know that. He's my favorite. Those expressions on his face, <laughs> fabulous. Gee, I like him on your face, too. Thank you, know? you. Nicholson usually plays smart. This time right. he plays dumb. But no matter what he plays, one of his neatest gimmicks is the way where he pauses, and you can figure out what he's thinking. And he's almost <laughs> conspiring with the audience to say, what am I going to do about these guys? And I just love that all, all right. through this movie. Yep. Next on, if we pick the Oscars, our choices for the worst nominations of the year. That'll be interesting. <laughs> and also our choice for the year's best visual effects. Seven thirty and 10 p.m. only on Channel 11. In a moment, we'll be giving our choices for who we feel are the year's worst nominees, or at least the least deserving nominees. That's always the most popular part of the program in some circles. Our circle. And the least popular part of the program in certain other circles. Hollywood and New York. Certain of the nominees. But first, <laughs> the category of best visual effects. This is where the movie magicians do their work, asking us to believe that we are seeing the impossible. And let's look at our choices. Gene, mm -hmm. in this category, you would nominate, you would vote for Young Sherlock Holmes, yeah. a movie produced by Steven Spielberg. Yeah, I wasn't crazy about the movie, but I did like the visual effects, as did you. Best That's visual right. effects, Young Sherlock Holmes. Now, there were some very special visual effects this year, effects that left us scratching our heads, but Young Sherlock Holmes, I guess now in both of our views, leads the nominees. Here are some reasons why. snakes aren't all that special, the beady eyes, not all that special, but that walking stained glass window, I do not know how they did it. I don't want to know how they did it. I do know how they did it because I talked to the man who did it. It was all done with computer animation and then laid on through an optical effect. And it was all, the entire stained glass window really existed only in the mind of the computer. Fabulous effect. Now let's go on to the you category ruined it for me. that I believe, you, did, you thought it was a real stained glass yes, window, I did. didn't you? Well, what can I say? Uh, let's go on out of the category I believe belongs in every discussion of the Academy Awards, the least deserving nominations of the year. These are people who have been good in other years, good in other films, may be good again, may even have been good this year, but not in our opinion, good enough to be nominated for Academy Awards. And Gene, yeah? I have your, <laughs> just a little bit of a, a sadist in every critic, I think. You yes. think the worst and most undeserved nomination of the year mm -hmm was Jessica Lange for Best Actress in Sweet Dreams. Oh, you bet I do, because I think there are a whole bunch of actresses who did a better job than Jessica Lange. I can think of a whole lot, too, starting with Norma, Norma Aleandro in Official Story, That's Six one Basic, them. and Marie, well, or even Rosanna Arquette. You want to hear my Lee list? Seeking Susan. You want to hear right. my list? I wrote, down, wrote them down in an envelope. Mm -hmm. Kathleen Turner, Pritzi's Honor, mm -hmm. Miranda Richardson, Dance with a Stranger, Vanessa Redgrave, Weatherby, Cher in Mask. So maybe my nominee might be in the same Best Actress category. <laughs> Maybe you're right. 
you wrote it, you ought to know. Best Actress category, and Bancroft, you think she's undeserving. Mm -hmm. We think this category is all screwed up. My choice for the worst nomination <laughs> was Jessica Lange for Best Actress for playing country singer Patsy Cline in Sweet Dreams. I thought, for example, that Beverly D'Angelo did a better job with the same character, Patsy Cline, in a supporting role in a much better movie a few years ago called Coal Miner's Daughter. Lange's role had sort of a standard biography movie quality to it. A performer yeah, stifled by her dreams, then troubled in love, oh, and then, in her case, dreams. whammo, well, she goes down in a well. plane crash. Now, the ultimate test of how un unappealing this movie was for me, I felt absolutely no remorse when the plane crashed. I was just able to get out of my seat and go leave the theater. An average performance in what I'm afraid it was, a poorly scripted film. Actually, if you're looking for good performances in that movie, you should look at Ed Harris as her husband, yes? who gives a very interesting uh, performance. Okay. My choice for least deserving nominee this year was Anne Bancroft, despite the fact that she did a sound and a competent job of playing the Mother Superior in Agnes of God and did not display the tendency toward overacting, which I disliked so much in her last film, Garbo Talks. That's the one where when she finally found Garbo, she did all the talking. Garbo listened. I think in Agnes of God, I think this was a bad nomination because there was nothing extraordinary in the performance. No dimensions that we discovered about this character that were not there right from the beginning. Somehow, an Oscar nomination should be for work more original, more compelling than it was in this film, and not just for good professional work in a fairly standard way. I think that's important. In both of these cases, these actresses, I don't think, were given enough of a script. That's right to really do anything special mm -hmm. with. And I think that they got nominated probably because they are very popular human beings out there. That's They're right. nice people, but the scripts weren't there. And these other people that we've named gave performances of their career and they were ignored. So maybe what we're criticizing here is not Jessica Lange and Ann Bancroft in a way for what they did, because they did what they could. But what we're criticizing is the Academy for not looking a little bit harder and you doing bet. its own you homework bet. and saying, let's look at some more movies, let's reach out a little bit and find that deserving person who's really made a that personal That Norma Alejandro had to be nominated. And I say Vanessa Redgrave for Weatherby, that is a magnificent performance. These, these are in another class than these other performances, and it's in the scripts. That's it for our choices, and uh, not only our choices for the ones we would pick, but our choices for the ones that we wouldn't pick. We'll join you March the 24th, watching the Academy Awards to see how those 4,000 100 real voters made their selections, and until then, we'll see you at the movies. Raisinets and Goobers are playing everywhere, starring plump, juicy raisins and great golden peanuts. Both now feature creamy Nestle milk chocolate. Curel moisturizing lotion. Most women agree Curel ends dry skin. Demand the best from Star Bronze. Real wood, the natural tone exterior wood preservative for beautiful wood that lasts, prolongs life for wood. Tomorrow night at 8, Nick Nolte and Deborah Winger are crazy about each other, living and loving in a crazy place called Cannery Row. Don't miss the broadcast premiere of Cannery Row, tomorrow night at 8, right here on Channel 11.